Hello, welcome to Group Therapy. Today we are joined by sales. We have Derek, we have Connor, which you might remember. He's in our marketing group. And we have Nolan, who's in showroom sales. Today we are going to be discussing some more long-range precision stuff. Derek, what are we going to do here? Uh, what we're doing today is uh, we're talking about uh, getting into long-range shooting um, and basically to, with the objective of keeping it simple. Um, I think a lot of the times people want to get in, into long-range shooting, but they hear so much about it being overly complicated, and a lot of people just say, screw it, I'm not even going to bother. There's too much money to have to get into it. It's too, there's too much to know, and uh, online forums definitely do not help. Yeah, they don't seem to do any favors. No, so I've got uh, these gentlemen with me here today. Um, uh, Nolan's done a bit of long-range shooting, mostly hunting, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Connor's done mostly short-range carbine shooting and pistols and that sort of thing, so nothing really passed about 100 yards or so. Yeah, the closest or longest shot I've ever taken mm-hmm. was uh, 100 yards on a torso-sized steel plate. So Right, so you're both shooters, but um, for the purposes of long-range, the... The addition is just turrets and reticles and just paying attention to more of what's going on. So uh, basically, we came up with a few um, notes, a few points to go, to uh, talk about, and we're just going to flow through it here and uh, hopefully keep it as simple as possible. And anyone who is watching, listening, can uh, pretty much learn what's important, what's not, uh, what to pay attention to, um, and go from there. So, Connor, um, why don't you kick this off? We have a few uh, bullet points here. How do you want to start this? Well, let's start off with uh, just basic fundamentals. Um, and one thing I am curious about, uh, MOA, I am I know what that means, minute of angle. Right. What is mil? Mil is short for milliradian. So milli being the uh, precursor, whether, whatever it is, to... It means one one thousandth of something, so millimeter, one 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 thousandth of a meter. Uh, so basically, it's a one one thousandth of a radian. So what's a radian? So uh, this is mil is a bit more complicated to explain what it is, and and truth be told, you don't even need to know what it really is to to be able to use the scope effectively. But if you are curious, back in uh, Back in school, uh, we can see, take a circle, right? Now, how do you get a radian from that? Because radian, like a degree, is just a unit of, of measurement for an angle. So you take a line from the center of the circle to the edge, right? Okay. Whatever line length that is, let's just call it X. You, ten, you then take that length of line and you drape it along the outside of the circle. Same length. So if this was to scale, this is about, what, six inches. If I drape this six inches over. Let me stop right there. Just for everyone that's not watching along with the video podcast yeah. who are just listening, uh, we have a whiteboard here, and Derek's kind of breaking down um, what the terminology is and how it relates to the scope. Yes, I'll verbally yeah. explain. So we'll just have to try so to be a little, little cognizant for those that aren't actually watching. Yeah. We'll explain what we're doing. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So I've taken a circle, I've 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 drawn a line from the very center of it straight out to the edge of the circle. And the length of that line, if you then take it from where the circle hits the line on the on the edge. So it's half the diameter. It, it, it's a radius, yeah. yeah. And then take that length and you kind of drape it along the outside of the circle like that, and you kind of draw a line back to center, pretty much making a pizza slice, mm-hmm. right? Like that. That's a radian. So from the center mm-hmm. where the, the line starts to the outer edge. Right here. Yep. Um, kind of looking at, I mean, now it looks like a Pac-Man, basically. Almost. So from the center to the outer edge, let's just call that five feet. Five feet, no, yeah. That's, no. it, it can be whatever you want it yeah, to yeah. be because it's always going to be a radian. So what you'll do is from the outer point, then you'll measure five feet up on that circle, on that arc. Yeah, you're what five feet is and you make another point from there you then go back to the center creating the pizza slice yeah it's so that's one radian it's one radian yeah and there are and a circle is made up of two pi radians mm. so it's about one sixth of a circle roughly speaking okay um so like i said there's a bit more so like 10 minutes on a clock pretty much uh but it's 
like I said, a bit more complicated to explain, but here's what it actually comes down to. Um, so we've, we've established where the radian is, is this angle right there. Um, you then take that and you divide that into a thousand. That, a thousand that, little that pizza slice. slices. Okay. Yeah, a thousand little pizza slices, right? One of those mills, right? That's how scopes click. So that uh, more specifically, a lot of these turrets will click in tenth mil, mm -hmm. uh, which mil is also noted as MRADs, milliradian uh, mils. There's uh, pretty much this the, the same thing. Schmidt Bender scopes actually they have notations on their scopes as five hundredths. Some of them. Well, yeah, a uh, centimeter or okay. half a centimeter. Mm -hmm. Would you say that mil is more precise than MOA? Uh, measurably speaking, no. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in uh, just a second. But on the, the scopes that are labeled as one centimeter, the reason they do that is because the click value for one-tenth is exactly one centimeter of movement at 100 meters. Mm -hmm. So a mill is basically one thing tall at a thousand things long. So if I took these markers and I stacked them all together, a thousand down the line here, I stood one up at the end of it, that's a mill. Okay. So it doesn't matter what your unit actually is, markers, apples, yards, feet, whatever. It's, that's going to be a mill. Um, but uh, to answer your question, which one is a more precise measurement, that or the MOA, that's going to be MOA because if we just boil this down to 100 yards that we're shooting at, one click on a 10th mil scope is going to move that impact about a third of an inch on the target. A quarter minute scope is about 0.26 inches, which um, is a little bit finer. Does that matter? Um, in most cases, not even close. Because what's that that difference at a thousand yards, an inch, or thereabout? So if your rifle is super accurate, like a bench rest rifle, capable of doing a two or three inch group at a thousand yards, and you're trying to make score. That matters, and that's why you see a lot of like the Night Force competition and the March scopes and all that will have one eighth MOA clicks. Yep. And uh, as you go further down range, like Schmidt Bender has that 545 and 327, those will shoot really far. They have options for 0.05 mil clicks, which is, of course, um, twice as fine as your standard tenth mil. But um, MOA, by comparison, clear this whiteboard here partly. We can start with the same circle, right? And we know that a circle made up 360 degrees, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, take one of those degrees. This is not to scale, of course. Take one of those degrees, and anyone who does navigation and map reading and such will know that when you break down a degree, that's made up of minutes. Yep. So... You take that one degree, it's made up of 60 minutes. So again, we're taking that pizza slice and, and we're putting more slices into We're further that. dividing it, yeah. Yep. And then a scope's going to click mostly mm -hmm. in a quarter of one minute. So it's not exactly a inch per 100 yard situation because one minute of angle is actually closer to 1.047 inches at 100 yards. And a lot of people, I think, will gravitate to MOA when they're just learning because it's, it's more relatable yeah. in terms of something that's recognizable to them. Yeah. Um, but uh, you can set yourself up to be a little bit... Uh, it, it can be more difficult down the road because you should only be thinking whenever you shoot... I don't care if you shoot mil, MOA, whatever it is, mm -hmm. never think inches of drop or drift or anything like that when you're doing long-range shooting, ever. I'm okay if, if you say, okay, you know, I did a five-inch group at 800 yards. Okay, you know, that's that's fine. But when you're dealing with drop and drift, your scopes are set up for mil and MOA, not inches. Mm -hmm. uh, some scopes, like uh, U.S. Optics, I think, used to do this. Their scopes were set up for what's called shooter's MOA, which is uh, pretty much inch per 100 yard based. That contrasts to what's called true MOA, which is what I've just described, the one that's 1.047 inch at 100 so, um, but uh, mill, I think, is more useful for long-range shooting for a few reasons. 
a lot of people, myself included, like to think decimal mm -hmm. instead of fractional. So it's easier for me to remember 1,000 yards on my M24, 11.2 mils, versus, what's that, 38 and a quarter MOA. It's easier to communicate a decimal. Is that why the military and police would prefer mil over MOA for their optics? It's a good question. A lot of the times what the military chooses comes down to regulations and international agreements, NATO, uh, the Europeans are metric, of course, so they're going to use that. The military a lot of the times uses meters when they, when they do distance, so it might just be the fact that we are involved with a lot of European-based nations militarily. And we might have just standardized on, on the metric system. Yeah. I don't know. But that's, that's just a guess. If anyone knows for a fact, I'm sure they, they can comment down below. 762 NATO and 308. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. Same bullet diameter, but just metric versus imperial. More or less the same round, practically speaking, in most yeah. cases. So um, it pretty much just comes down to that. And also, if you look at the market for long range optics, especially when you get up towards the higher end stuff like this Collis, Night Force, and what have you, you have way more options in mil. Mm -hmm. uh, like Night Force does the MOAR reticle in the ATAC-R. And that's it. Yeah. Versus the mil XT, the H59, the mil C, the Tremor 3, uh, and they used to do the mil R as well. So 5 to 1 ratio of mil reticle to MOA. Mm -hmm. Schmidt Bender has even more mil reticles to, to, to the MOA. Yep. So um, for that reason, it's a good question of what came first, chicken or, or the egg. But um, the fact of, of the matter is, if you're, if you're getting into long-range shooting, it's worth the initial difficulty in learning mills. Yeah. Because once you clear that hurdle, you're good. Yeah, because like, then you're not really forming a bad habit kind of exactly. thing. If you're going to learn, learn right the first time. Exactly. I, I've always been MOA, and I'll say, I mean, I always want to switch over to mill, but I've done it so long that it's kind of hard for me to That's at this point. That's a very common one. Yeah. But it, if I was saying for somebody to start, it is so much easier to start with mills than mm -hmm. it is MOA. You have more options. I mean, everything's unlimited. As long as you're starting off on the right foot. Yes. Because if, if you practice incorrectly, it's you're gonna, it's gonna be a mess. Yeah. Um. So it's worth it to understand mills, mm -hmm. and you you and like I said, you don't need to know how to get there. Yeah. All you need to know is the drop is quantified in mills. Mm -hmm. That's it. And but then this video, I mean, basics, don't overcomplicate it. I mean, yes, just, yeah, you don't need to, I mean, what we just went over to, to just get into it. You don't need to know that mm -hmm. you don't need to. Um, it definitely helps though. When you're with other people that are shooting to understand what, what exactly they're talking about. It's good to know a lot about your chosen discipline, of mm -hmm. course. But, um, you know, if I told you take this ATAC R and dial it to dial it to four mils, you're just going to go, okay, four mm -hmm. says it right there. Hold dead on the target, squeeze a shot. If you were shooting a 6.5 Creedmoor, that's like a 400-yard, 500-yard shot. You know, so um, that's how simple it can be. Mm -hmm. And really, there's no practical way to measurably say MOA is better than mil or vice versa. Even yep. though MOA is technically more precise, it's, too, it's to such a small degree where it just doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So uh, using the reticle to spot your impacts... That's a key feature of this whole operation. You need to be able to do that to shoot long range successfully. So part of that is is understanding how to use your reticle. And part of that is having good form so that you can recover from the recoil and actually watch that. So if you're shooting like a 6.5 at 1,000 yards, that bullet's going to take about a second and a half to get there. That's enough time for you to recover from the recoil and actually watch the splash in, in the dirt or hit the hit on steel or what have you. But uh, basically, using the reticle to spot your impacts is very important. So going back to the whiteboard. Yep, going back to the whiteboard here. I'm drawing a reticle here. I'm going to use a very basic sort of mill dot arrangement here just because it's easier to visualize. Okay. So let's say you have, you're aiming at your target dead on. This little blue right in the middle here. Okay. And let's say you make your shot. And it lands here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, basically, that shot has landed one mil right and one mil low. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, to make the correction, you can either dial your windage turret 
and then dial your elevation turret mm -hmm. by one mil left, one mil up, and as long as nothing else has really changed, like like the wind and such, that shot's going to be moved directly on target. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of reticles these days are a lot more complicated than this. So you got to find that happy medium. Reticle selection is very personal. Mm -hmm. um, I like the idea of the Christmas tree layout. I don't like one that's too, too busy. But uh, like a Night Forces Mill XT, the, uh, all the EBR reticles from Vortex, uh, the grid from Schmidt and Bender, the Skimmer 3 and Skimmer 4 from Collis, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, those are all going to be grid reticles or, or a tree reticles that are not too, too complicated. A lot of people will see something like the H59 or the Tremor. And there's a lot going on there. And some guys like that. And if you like that reticle, I'm not going to talk you out of it. Yeah. It just takes a bit of time to learn how to use because there's a lot of markers going on there. But the end all is, is the same. You're going to use your reticle to measure to see where that shot was. It can get a little bit more complicated when you have something that's like, let's say it's like here, you know, or here. A little, not at a whole mil. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is a lot of reticles these days, they have finer notations on the line. So instead of just having... A, a marker every whole mil, they'll have some every half mil or every two tenths. They'll have a line there. So you'd be able to really get in there, compare where your bullet landed to where you were aiming using that, that reticle and the lines on it. Your follow-up shot can be ascertained and delivered much faster so and accurately. Just, um, again, for the people that are listening and yeah. might not be watching, Yeah. Um, and this is also, to, you can confirm this as well. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you've got your mill dots, they're mm -hmm. going one mill, two mill, and so on, and then you've got your hash marks in the middle, that's not really any different than the fraction marks on a tape measure between inches. Conceptually, I mean, it, it's no it, different. It gives you, I mean, it tells you where you are, and it gives you a more precise measurement. So mm -hmm. if you, without seeing it, again, if you're not watching this on video, think of it like that. Is Like a tape measure has the, you know, quarter of an inch, half an inch, and then it breaks down to an eighth, mm -hmm. sometimes even the sixteenth. So yeah. that's essentially what these other little hash marks are between your hole marks. Exactly. A lot of uh, scope manufacturers will have every hole mill is going to be an obvious big line yep. on it. And then a, and then a Usually they'll have the number on it too. Yes. I, I like it when they have numbers. Mm -hmm. um, then a smaller line about every half and then tiny little ones. Because mm -hmm. you don't want to have lines everywhere. It's, right. it's, it, it'd be too much trying to count. But um, And that kind of goes into personal preference as well. Like I'm, I'm fine with... Big line every whole mil and a uh, smaller line every half mil. I can visually get the difference there to a reasonable amount of accuracy. I just like it to be as simple as possible while still giving me the information. So basically, that's how you would use a reticle um, to spot your shots. And this helps when you're, when you're zeroing as well. Yes. So if you, do a, if you do your, let me start fresh here. If I'm shooting on paper at whatever distance, and that's, we'll get to this, this ties into first focal plane, which we'll get to. Um, if I do a group and it lands here, here, I can say, okay, I don't need, I don't need a paper with grid lines on it. I don't need to know my distance. I don't need to know any of that, as long as it's first focal, it is. Um, uh, according to my graph here, my reticle looks like we are one and a half mils, maybe 1.4 mils to the right. You agree? And then we are about, what, 1.2? 1.2? 1.2 yeah. mils low. So I'll just dial up and left by those amounts. Next, the next group's going right where you need it to. Yeah. Which saves ammo as well, which is nice. Yeah. Another thing that you could do is just dial, I mean, keep your reticle on target and make sure that you're stable and still, mm -hmm. and you could dial right down and right over. Make sure you're stable. Stable. That's stable is the big word there. The, the thing is, once you start touching that turret, you don't you can't know. Can't go back. You don't know. Yeah. So um, yes, that is a decent way to do it. It's a good way to do that if you have a scope that doesn't have a Mill. milling reticle yes. like that. Yep. So you have like a number four reticle or a plex or something that's very very basic. That's an okay method to use. Yeah. But then again, those scopes aren't long range scopes. Exactly. So it's a little bit different. Concept. You got to be stable. Yeah. That's yeah. another big thing. Yeah. Another thing I'm curious about: uh, data keeping. So. Data keeping is important. Uh, you don't need to record everything. Just keep it simple. Uh, so if you're just getting into it, I would say um, keep a small logbook in your range bag. I record 
the altitude that I'm at and the temperature, mm-hmm. pretty much. I'll I'll record the condition of the gun as well. So cold or cold and dirty because I don't mm-hmm. I don't clean my precision guns until they start to lose accuracy. Um, so that can be months and months and months. So basically, I'll have a, a notebook and there's a thousand yard range up here in Trout Run where in the dead of summer where it's 90 degrees out, mm-hmm. I'm going to record 90 degrees at uh, Pennsylvania 1000 yard bench rest club mm-hmm. and thousand yard dope is 12.2 mils or whatever it yep. is, 11.2 mils. Same thing in the, in the, the winter, especially and we'll get to this as well. Um, temperature and the same location is going to matter. Mm-hmm. So then you're talking about air density. Yeah. Uh, we have that penciled in to, to, to go into w- w- with a bit more detail and we will, but uh, basically to answer your, your question here, I would record the temperature and the altitude. Or at least where you are, basically. Would wind be a good thing to write down to as well? It, if it, it's a common place that you're going to shoot at a lot. It can be. The thing is with the wind. Mm-hmm. I feel like it variates so it's, much. That's, that's the problem. Yeah. I mean, we were shooting at we're, the farm with that Kadex, that, that tremor that one time. We had winds coming from, the, coming from about 4 o'clock, from point blank to like 300 yards. Then it was coming from about 9 o'clock at about uh, 500 yards. And then it was 4 o'clock again at the target at about 700 yards. Yeah. It's all over the place. You, you, you can't mm-hmm. take a good measurement like that. Yeah. Uh, with, our, with our situation at the farm, we're, I mean, anyone that's seen any of the videos where we do shooting at the mm-hmm. farm, we're talking seven to 800 yards. Mm-hmm. We're on one mountaintop shooting over to another mountaintop. There's a valley in between. Yeah. And that thing's just a wind tunnel on most days. Oh, it, it's, it's totally turbulent. Yeah. So it's you never really, really know what you're going to get until you fire that first test shot. Yeah. Now, um, t- typically, I'll try and, I might keep a note on wind, but there's so much variation you can't replicate those same conditions. Yeah. Yep. Where you could replicate, you know, you go to the range at the same place and you go there a week later and the temperature is still the same. Those are consistent. Okay. Wind wind is not. Yep. Other question, uh, ballistics, uh, yeah. internal, external, and terminal. What can you tell me about those? Mostly this is all about external, but internal ballistics is what's going on with the gun as it's being fired, while the bullet is in the barrel, movements, vibrations, harmonics, all that sort of stuff, that's internal ballistics. Um, so the people who made this Bergara with this carbon fiber barrel, they, were, they would be studying internal ballistics. Once the bullet leaves the barrel, now we're on to external. So things like air, wind, drag. Density. That sort of thing. Yes, exactly. That's external. Terminal is what happens when the bullet hits the target. So someone who's focused on hunting or self-defense will focus primarily on terminal ballistics. If we're just hitting targets and hitting steel, we don't really give too much of a care about terminal ballistics for the most part, just external. Okay. Yeah. So let me ask a question on that terminal ballistics sense yeah. in terms of hunting. So we know, I mean, a lot of hunting loads, most probably all, they enter with a small hole, they exit with a bigger hole. Yep. That's your factor of ballistics, is it not? That's terminal ballistics, yeah. yeah. So would that also have to do with like bullet weight, velocity, that sort of thing? Terminal ballistics, it, yeah, that that's that's complicated. Sectional density, the the construction of the bullet itself, the 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 twist, the type of target, you know, that's it's bonded or not? Lead core is bonded to the. Oh um, yeah, yeah. We we'll be shooting some of that Saco um, power blade stuff. That's all copper with a little polymer tip on it. So you know that's it's. That's a whole other conversation, but uh, but yeah, basically that's that's uh, terminal ballistics, seeing what happens to the bullet as it strikes and interacts with the target. I know one thing that a lot of people get hung up on as far as external ballistics is mm-hmm. ballistic coefficient. Yeah. Is it that important to get started? You do need to get pretty close, but the the good thing is a lot of these bullet manufacturers. Will I'm give saying you that. like the highest ballistic coefficient bullet just to get started. No. I agree. It's a combination of a couple things. You need a, 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 a good BC is nice. Mm-hmm. Usually you get that with a heavier bullet. So let's, let's go to the extreme here. Uh, the 750 grain AMAX bullets that we shot out of that Kadex, that has a G1 BC of over one, mm-hmm. like 1.05 or something. But it's not as strong as a long range cartridge mm-hmm. as something like a 375 Shytac, which has a lower BC, something in the 0.8s, I think. 
but it's going so much faster. Yes. So it's a blend of BC and velocity mm -hmm. that'll really influence how far you can practically shoot that round. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what everyone's always going to be experimenting with. Yeah. It's the whole nature of the game. Mm -hmm. So, well, I guess moving on, uh, turrets. I've come across this a lot just with what I do here. Exposed caps. I've noticed that the ones with the exposed one, exposed turrets tend to be a little uh, higher end. Well, yeah, it, it's expensive to make a turret like this in the same way that an expensive set of calipers that'll give you a 10,000th of an inch measurement. You know, the, something that is made to be very precise is more expensive to manufacture. Now, with the exposed turrets, wouldn't you run the risk of bumping it or accidentally making an accidental adjustment? Technically, yes, but I rarely actually ever see it happen. Because I, I move my, my uh, guns around in soft cases, hard cases. I have a, an, I have a uh, backpack with a scabbard. It's an Eberly Stock G2. I have one of those. I put my M24 in there, and I take that thing out all the time. It's never moved. And a lot of these scop, uh, scopes have locking turrets, which are nice, but you know, I don't, it's not a mandatory thing for me. Zero stop is nice because you can always just check it before you start shooting. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's not as big an issue as people make it out to be. Because the antidote to that, even if it does move, is just you should be checking your stuff before you make a shot, which yeah. you pretty you much have always the time have the time. Too. Yeah, yeah. So. Now, the exposed uh, elevation turret, that makes sense because you have to compensate for bullet drop. But You're on it all the time, yeah. Exposed windage turrets, uh, how often would you actually use that? Personally, I zero it and I leave it alone. Uh, it comes down to the individual user. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys will just zero their, their windage at whatever distance and leave it. And I'm fine with that. They'll hold for wind because yep. wind changes too quickly to have an elevation to, or to have a turret dial actually make sense. But there are some people though, where if you're, if you're shooting, you see this sometimes with uh, long range precision matches mm -hmm. where if the wind that day is between 10 and 20 miles an hour, they'll set their windage turret for the drift on the lowest wind. Yep, at 10. So if, they're, if, if the wind is going to push you a bu your bullet between 2 to 4 mils, let's just say, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll dial 2 mils out of it. That way they're holding dead on if it's a 10-mile-an-hour wind, or 2 mils if it's a 20-mile-an-hour wind, and that can be a little bit faster. And for, for something like PRS and that sort of thing, speed is necessary. But it just comes down to the individual user. That's um, a lot of wind as well. It is miles an hour. That's that's a lot. Yes, of wind. I mean, like I have one of these Colossus on my 300 PRC, and uh, that's a very wind resistant round. Uh, I've never had to touch it really. I just hold, and we're good to go there. My M24 has a US Optics 10 power on it that has capped windage. I do like it that way. It's just it's at no risk of being bumped or anything. Not that that would be an, a real issue like we've just discussed. It's also it 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 can be a cost saver at the factory. It's easier to make a turret that is capped because it doesn't need to be precise and hold up to the abuses of knocks and drops and that sort of thing. So if, so if we compare it to something like the Zeiss V4, great hunting scope this is. Um, the turret is pretty basic on this, right? Yep. I mean, it's, it's hardly anything at all. It's made to be zeroed, put the cap on, and you're done. Is that a locking turret as well? Yeah, but I mean, it doesn't need it doesn't, to be. Look, yeah, because it's capped. It's not. It's oh, not. It's not locking. Actually, you lift to re-index it. Okay, just, just like that. So it's not okay. locking. But uh, it's basically made. You get your zero. Mm -hmm. You lift. You put that inverted triangle on the marker. You're you're good to go. And most most hunting in in the in the U.S., especially us here in the, the Northeast, whitetail, you're less than 300 yards. I mean, my last two deer were 50 and 75. So no one's really worrying about bullet drop or wind for most types of hunting. Mm -hmm. um, the types of people that are doing uh, longer range hunting, there are scopes out there like this Vortex Razor LHT that blends the lightness and simplicity of a hunting scope with the features like turrets and reticle for long range shooting. That was the first video we did actually on our podcast was um, uh, lightweight, long range, uh, dual purpose scopes like that. Now, one thing that I and I'm sure a lot of our viewers are curious about is parallax. Uh, yes. What is it? Parallax is the movement of an object based off of an, an offset viewing angle. So if I 
look at that camera here and I put this scope up, right? Okay. And if I center myself up on that, we can see that. If, if I move a little bit like this, you know, you'll see this compared to where it is on my shirt. You'll see that move on the target. Okay. It's the same, like if you've seen Wayne's World, when he goes camera one, camera two, camera one, camera two, he's, that's parallax. You're looking at the same thing from a different angle. I see. And so when you put an object between what you're looking at and your eye, this is your reticle. So if, I'm, if I center up the top of this on your, on your nose and I move my head, now it's at your ear, now it's at your other ear. That's parallax. Okay. So what that really does in a... What that means in a scope is that you're not viewing it exactly in the same centered position as you were before, let's say. But you can't. It's impossible because we're humans. We're not robots. So the way to, to uh, fix that is a parallax knob. It's on top on the colluses that actually moves a mechanism on the front part of the tube here. And it, it moves lenses and lines them all up. That way, when you do look like this you kind of move your head I'm still looking through the scope I can still see my target if that reticle is moving relative to the target as I'm dancing my head around it parallax needs to be corrected and I'll I'll sit there and I'll shake my head a little bit and I'll adjust my parallax and say, okay now the reticle is static on the target even when I move my head around mm -hmm. because um, basically if you don't set the parallax right that, that, that movement on the reticle, that could influence how big your group is, which is, we don't want big groups, we want small groups. Yep. Um, so when it comes to parallax also, I do want to mention the numbers that are on your parallax knob, they're more of a guideline than actual. Yeah, lines. I learned that the hard way. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically, I'll, I'll set it to get close, and then I'll, then I'll check it, I'll test it, doing that little head wiggle and, and see. Because sometimes, I mean... You might be shooting 200 yards, and you might be at the three or 400 yard parallax. Yeah. Parallax changes with atmospherics. You can't use it as a rangefinder. No, <laughs> you cannot. No. Now, going back to the uh, windage and elevation turrets, what can you tell me about translating versus non-translating turrets? Uh, as luck would have it, I have two scopes up here that demonstrate both. Um, so, translating means as you spin the turret, the turret actually moves away from the scope. So if we look at this ATAC R here, I'll face it so you guys can see it. I'm going to bottom it out real quick. Okay. Now pay mind to the area right here at the base of the turret. As I dial it, you see how we're exposing other lines here? I see, see how it's actually moving away from the scope? That's a translating turret. This is uh, not something that a novice would really, really care about mm -hmm. in long-range shooting. It's something that I don't really care about either too much, but um, uh, that's a translating turret. Non-translating, like this collis here. It stays in place? It stays in place. So how do you know where you're at on the rev counter? Because this one, the, the night force, as that turret moved away from the body of the scope, it exposed horizontal lines so you kind of know where you're at. This, and many like it, is a double turn turret. So if we start at zero, okay, mm -hmm. as we go up, when we, when we hit the second rev, watch right there. See that? Yeah, I see. This little red thing sticks out the top when you're on the second rev, okay? Uh, that's so that you know when this uh, red piece is up and this scope is now indicating 4 mils and 20 mils, what setting are you actually at? So 4 mils on the 20. second revolution. 20. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Now, if we just bring it down a bit, three, the, three mils. Because you're in the bottom, it's yes. in the bottom. So when this little uh, uh, red indicator is exposed and up, you read the top number. Okay. So that way you know where you're at. Old scopes didn't have too much of that. So you had to guess, well, not so much guess, count. Okay, I'm, I'm one rev in, two revs in, and that sort of thing. So you can just as well easily look at this and go, okay, I'm at... Coincidentally, four mils, so or a, a 20, <laughs> 20, 20 mils. So um, that's a good way to keep track of where you're at on the turret. I will say from experience, um, I actually got introduced to turrets with uh, Night Force NXS, and it did not have a zero stop. 
Yep, made mine did so better. Yeah. indexing <laughs> as far as that goes, that's nice mm-hmm. because you can remember where your zero is. I took a red sharpie. Yeah, and on these little horizontal lines, yep, I just made a little mark, mm-hmm. and that was my zero. So yep. if 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 I was on zero and I could just barely see half of that horizontal line, mm-hmm. I'm on zero. Yep, but that's been advanced these days with zero stops exactly. and second rev indicators and on Schmidt Bender's multi turn indicators with all, all kinds of, of stuff there. So. Now, on that note, uh, turret travel, um, yeah. I've seen on just in my research, uh, it's elevation that tends to have more travel. And mm-hmm. That's kind of obvious to compensate for bullet drop. Exactly. So I'm guessing just more travel is better, uh, higher end. It is better. Uh, there's a point where you need to know kind of how much you need to accomplish your task. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll get to this when we talk about ballistic apps. But basically, you need to have enough turret travel to dial to the range that you want to. So if we take two extremes here, uh, let's take this ATAC-R again. 120 MOA of total travel. Okay? Let's, I had one of these on my 375 Shytac. Mm-hmm. I had it on a 60-minute total slope mount. I had a 40-minute rail and a 20-minute air attack. Um, my zero was pretty much three MOA from the bottom. Mm-hmm. I could shoot that thing 2,600 yards and dial for it. Um, a 22 with the same sort of uh, same sort of setup. Let's just say that's four or five hundred, which is insanely far for a 22. For a 22, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. but you kind of get what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. So um, if you compare that to, uh, there are some scopes that don't have a lot of travel. So there's a finite number of clicks on these things. So you're dialing out, you're dialing out, you're dialing out, and then it stops. You've hit you've hit the end of it. So you can, de- you can determine how much scope travel you need once you have an idea for your, your uh, bullet drop and how far you, re- you really need to shoot that. And we'll hit that when we talk about ballistic apps. Okay, a bit of a change of subject. Uh, yeah. Let's talk a bit about the glass, uh, more specifically the reticle. Okay. Okay, so uh, etched glass versus non-etched glass. Everything's going to be etched these days. Everything's going to be etched? Pretty much, yeah. Um, it's... It's the strongest, it's the easiest to manufacture, and when you start introducing complicated reticle designs, mm-hmm. can't do that with a wire reticle, which is what they used to be. Just a thin piece of wire in there, in between the, the uh, lenses. I mean, an old U-Nerdle, you had hair. Ex- exactly, <laughs> ex- exactly. So to, to make the reticles um, with, the, with the bullet drop markers and the mill markers and all that sort of stuff, everything's etched, everything's CNC'd, so that's really not a worry. And turtle case. mechanisms at this point now, I mean... Oh, yeah. Now, for these uh, long-range competition shooters, I would say um, the overwhelming majority of them use first focal plane rather than second focal plane. Absolutely. Is uh, there a particular reason? Or uh, Yes. The reason is you can use your reticle no matter what magnification you're on. So first focal plane, if you see one, when you zoom in, the reticle gets Get bigger. bigger. Right. Second focal plane stays the same. It stays the same relative to your eye. The reason first focal plane is highly desired for such shooting is that uh, you want to be able to use that reticle for holds and measurements and that sort of thing like we discussed. But you might not want to be on full power. Like a lot of a lot of second focal plane scopes, the reticle, like your 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 hash marks and everything, they are only accurate at full power or or some fixed power. Now, some scopes like the NX-8 Night Forces, they do those in second focal plane. The reticles there, let me get my marker here, I'll kind of show you this. We draw our reticle design here. I'll be really basic here. So we have our lines on the left and right, let's say we'll focus on the right side for now. On the bottom will be a number. Let's just call it one. One in my way. Okay. Next one further out. Two MOA. So if you're at if you're at uh, 32 power on the NX8, mm-hmm. and you want to make a one minute hold for wind, you hold on the one minute mark right there. Fair enough. Yep. But the NX8 also will notate half of 32.16. So and so instead of the first marker being one. It would be two. It'd be two. And the second marker instead of two be four. would be four. They I do the math for you. 
they do. I can't recall if it's 32 on the bottom, 16 on top, or whichever one it was. But they give you that. And the, the uh, Night Force ATAC R, this is a, also a second focal plane scope. It subtends at 25 power for the reticle to function, just like that one. But it also has a dot right there at 12 and a half power. Yep. Same idea. If yep. you set the magnification down to half power, your reticle you then double your subtensions. Exactly. Yep. So that's a okay way of compensating for that. But uh, first focal plane, no matter what magnification you're on, if you want to make a two mil hold, two mil, squeeze it. It makes it easy. That was especially easy during uh, matches, especially when we had to do shots from 180 to like 650 and a few targets in between and back down, not allowed to touch your scope. So I set that to like eight or 10 power yep. and then I did the string. So um, yeah, being able to make those shots at any magnification is good because the a 525 scope, even if I'm shooting a thousand yards, but when the glass is so good, I'm not even going to be at 25. I'll be at like 15, dude. Um, I don't need a ton of power. I'll, I like to see my impact. I like to see the wider field of view. So I'll I'll uh, back it off, but I still want to use that reticle. Yep. That's why. Now with the first focal plane rifle so, rifle scope, as you're zooming in, if you had something like a big complicated uh, Christmas tree reticle. Mm -hmm. That would be getting bigger, but wouldn't that also have the potential to kind of obscure your field of view? Um, not so much a field of view target, yes. you could argue. And many people have made that argument. Truth of the matter is, doesn't it's a really preference matter. thing? It's not even a preference thing. I think a lot of it comes down to uh, just um, misconceptions. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're trying to really ring out if you're at the extreme of the precision shooting world, like unlimited bench rest, every micro inch of advantage, mm -hmm. those guys will go for it. So they use reticles that are extremely thin because they're not hunting and they don't, need to, they don't need to be able to see it amongst foliage and that sort of thing. And, they, and those guys dial for everything, so it doesn't matter. But um, when it comes to reticle thickness, I have a little notation here. Um, an ATAC R like this. This is the second focal plane 525 with the MOAR T reticle, the thin one. That reticle is uh, 0 0.0625 MOA thick. At 1,000 yards, it's 0 0.65 of, of an inch thick on that's, the target. That's nothing. That's about your thumb, right? Mm -hmm. So the reticle is that thick, right? The first focal plane version is twice as thick. Uh, so 1.3 inches thick at 1,000 yards on the target. That's about a golf ball, dude. Mm -hmm. Like it's you're still going to be able to hit what you're aiming at, and at two thousand yards, two point six inches. So you're you're still well within practical coverage of the target. Um, now, one thing that uh, people will say about first focal plane is, as you zoom out, you do lose the detail of the center of that reticle. Mm -hmm. But my argument there is, at the same time, if you're zoomed all the way out, you're not shooting very far. So You're usually not looking for detail either. Exactly. So you can just use the simple basic crosshair, which is pretty much what you see, and you're making a shot to 300 yards and in typically. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that's, I think, a uh, non-issue as well. And most people don't even shoot their scopes at that low power anyway. But even if you have to, there's no bullet drop to worry about. So, Next up, let's talk about uh, dope. Are we allowed to? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, dope uh, is our shorthand for the inf for the information. Um, I've heard it stand for data on personal equipment, data on previous engagements. That's what I thought it was. Yeah, I mean, it's whatever some military person said. I'm sure, but basically, it's the data that you've logged for your bullet. Uh, so basically, like I've said, I I write down when I'm shooting, where I'm shooting, temperature drop, that sort of thing, that's the dope. So if I ask, what's the dope on a 6.5 Creedmoor out to 1,200 yards, you say, okay, it, it's, you know, at 100 yards, it's zero, then it's 200 yards, it's 0.4 mils, and then all those out to, what about, probably 10, 11 mils out to 1,200 yards, that would be considered the dope. So um, if I say the, and we'll, we'll uh, find this out in the two weeks, we're shooting that Pergara out to about 11, 1,200 yards, this one actually. Um, so we'll say, you know, what's the dope to 1,200 yards? I don't know. 12 mils? Let me ask you. Um, if you, if someone asked you, like you had just said, mm -hmm. what's the dope on this, you know, mm -hmm. 6.5 Creed more, this many yards. 
Now, is that information that you can take and transfer anywhere? Because you're not talking about your uh, your thermal. You're you're not talking about your uh, environment, windage, all that kind of stuff. You're talking about the actual ballistical data that the the rifle is capable of at those distances. Not so much capable. It's the it's the data that you've recorded, and it, that can change. So. If you really want to get nitty gritty with the question, what's your dope out to twelve hundred yards? Okay, where are we? Right. Um, what's the temperature? What's the, the ammo? The ammo. Yeah. Uh, so Barrel there, length. I mean, there's tons of things. Well, that the come. dope. The dope kind of in the dope is kind of your weapon. Yeah. Uh, so if you have a twenty-two inch Bergara and I have my twenty-four inch M twenty-four, even if we're shooting the same ammo, our okay. dopes are likely to be different. So the, so the dope is. Like, like the one version of the acronym, personal equipment. So this is the dope for this rifle and with this ammo. But if you are in Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. and you know the dope of the rifle that you've been shooting, say, for a year, mm-hmm. and you've got a cousin out in Colorado, yeah, and you lend him your rifle, yeah, or he uses your rifle, mm-hmm. it's not a matter of saying, oh, well, this is the data. I mean, it's it's going to change in Colorado, isn't it? It is. I actually have some firsthand on that because we went out to uh, Casper, Wyoming on a prairie dog hunt years ago with uh, Swarovski. And uh, a 6.5 Creedmoor at 1,000 yards there, about 5,000 feet elevation, um, compared to the 1,300 feet of of elevation that we shoot at the farm at, was a mil different Mm. at 1,000 yards, just from the the, the, uh, higher altitude, lower lower uh, pressure from, or from that. So we're talking three feet worth of less drop by going up from 1,300 to 5,000 feet. Would that also have to do with something like uh, the density of the air, the air thickness? Exactly. That's exactly what that comes down to. So that's one of the, that's one of the reasons why altitude and temperature, if you're just starting out and you're, and you're, you're trying to keep it simple, altitude and temperature are going to be the biggest influences on your bullet drop how and would, how it changes how would like extreme differences in temperature like say 20 degrees uh, 20 degree weather versus 90 degree weather um my records on my m24 show at a thousand yards it's about a mil but that's seasonal of course you're not going to wake up to 20 and yeah. it's not you know out in the desert maybe out in arizona whatever mm-hmm. you get much bigger temperature variations during the day in the desert than you do here in Pennsylvania where it's green. Even out west, I mean, yeah. in the summer. Yeah. The temperature swings are crazy. Yeah, so depending on where you are and when you start shooting, you need to keep track of that. Um, but uh, here, the temperature, the high and low for Pennsylvania in the summer is only about 25 degrees, maybe 30. And you're not shooting in the dead of night when it's coldest compa- and then shooting in the middle of the day when it's hottest. You're, you're typically... You know, if you start shooting in, in the morning, you might notice a 10, 15 degree temperature change. That might influence you a little bit at 1,000, yep. maybe a click or so, but that's really not too, too significant. It's the bigger seasonal changes. Whereas, so I lived in Phoenix for two years, and one of the biggest things I learned while I was out there is just how different the weather is out there yeah. than it is here. Yeah. Um, so I would have to, I went out for school, and I, my motorcycle was my primary vehicle, so I knew firsthand what the air was like at different times of the day. Yeah. So 7 a.m., I'm riding into school on my motorcycle. It's 40 degrees out, yep. and it's super dense air, super cold. Mm-hmm. By, not, by noon, lunchtime, you're talking 115 degrees completely. I mean, they quote the dry heat, which is just basically the absence of moisture in the air. Then you're talking low, way low density. I mean, that's just in a span of well, four to six hours. Moisture in the air, I, I, I want to touch on this because a lot of people think that more humid air is more dense. It's not. Mm. It's less dense. All right, we'll break that down then. Well, we, uh, most of the air that we breathe in is nitrogen, mm. right? Um, it's like 70, 80% of it is nitrogen. Um, now, oxygen is the next biggest element in the air, mm. about 19%. And density is the amount of oxygen. Density is the amount of particles of something that that bullet's hitting. Mm-hmm. So it's, mo- it's hitting mostly nitrogen as it flies through the air. It, it's, it's, it's hitting everything. Mm-hmm. So when you take a molecule of nitrogen, it's heavier than oxygen, I think. Is it? 
I, I, th- I think they're right next to each other. Science talk with your talk. optic. <laughs> <laughs> I should know this. I, sh- I should know this. But ba- here's, here's the short answer. Water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Mm-hmm. Hydrogen is very light. It's the lightest element that we know of. So when there's more hydrogen in the air, in the form of H2O vapor, it's less dense. Interesting. It's like uh, filling a ball pit at a McDonald's with 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 uh, cue balls and then putting a few um, um, beach balls in there. It's going to be less dense per unit of volume. Yeah. So if you have any background in dealing with, say, carburetors, for example, machine <laughs> cars, I mean, that's where I learned about air density. Mm-hmm. So trying to apply it in, in what we're talking about here, I mean, my brain's... Really, a, it's firing, but it's confused at the same time. Well, I mean, I do want to check this on my phone here because now I'm really... I should know this as a meteorologist. I should know this. Um, I'm going to look this up. As far as table. mechanic terms, I mean, looking at it that way, when the air is more dense, your engine will actually run better. Right. It'll create more power. Yes. But because if, if you're able to get more air in it. The right. One so you're, time. Compressing, but, you're compressing more oxygen because your air is denser, so you have more oxygen. Yep, you're compressing yeah. that oxygen in your cylinder, mm-hmm. so that's where you get, you know, why you're, it, it's cold out. Your car drives better. That's yeah, why boost season in the in the, the early autumn. Yeah, but the, um, yeah, nitrogen is just a little bit lighter than oxygen. It's seven versus eight. They're right next to each other, but basically, um, hydrogen is so much lighter, mm-hmm. it'll it'll bring the the density down. So, but the, the the thing is though, I don't record it. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I've I've done I've done calculations and ballistic apps where I've done. One percent humidity, then ninety nine percent humidity, and it changes it by a, like a tenth of an inch or an inch at a thousand yards. One thing that I always do is common to me is whenever I'm making my click chart and say mm-hmm. applied ballistics, I always put the humidity at fifty percent. Standard atmosphere standard is uh, I believe it's like sixty seven. For what time? I mean. Most of my global stuff, average, I think it's like okay. six, I think sixty-seven, fifty-nine I mean, degrees is the average. Fifty, sixty-seven percent humidity, twenty-nine ninety-two on the pressure. Yeah. So, um, but the thing is, like I said, yeah, d- d- put it at fifty, leave it alone. Don't yeah. touch humidity. There's yeah. No point. Pause. That's what that's what I do. Now, one thing I've noticed on the Garmin smartwatches we sell is a lot of them come preloaded with applied ballistic software. It's a, mm-hmm. a shooting app. Yeah. Um, I guess basically, what does the applied ballistic software do? Does it take into account uh, just things like the dope and everything? Everything. Dude, Brian Litz is an absolute <laughs> maniac with ballistics. He knows everything, and he's done so much testing that, it, like, you would. It's. A, I'm surprised that he has so much time, and is. And he's a very smart guy, so he's done testing on a whole bunch of stuff, um, to include atmospherics, internal ballistics, things like uh, uh, hit probability based off of barrel length. And uh, he recently, I think, I'm not sure if it was recently, debunked the, my gun shoots better at 400 yards than does yeah. at 200 yards as far yeah. as MOA size, which is impossible. I think so. he's still waiting on a target to prove that fact. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> whatever the case, uh, applied ballistics is his baby, and uh, it's extremely detailed in the information that you can put into it. There's tons of other ballistics apps, though. There's Straylock, uh, Hornady has their Ford off, and there's a bunch of other ones that you can, that are, Factory provided by different manufacturers. Vortex has one on their website. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to sum all those up into one for the sake of this part of it. But basically, you input data about your weapon system and your atmospherics. And it says, okay, with a zero of this and all the information you've given me, that bullet's going to be dropping this much at this distance. It'll take this much time to get there. It'll hit with this much energy. And it'll have this much wind. So um, it's a really good place to start because if you have your rifle set up, it's a good place to get started because you will need to test those yourself to really trust them. And I'm, I'm, I don't mean you need to trust them every 100 yards or so. If you want to shoot out to 1,000 yards, test it at like 300, 600, and 1,000. Mm-hmm. That's enough points on the curve where if there is a discrepancy, you'll notice. Um, but basically, that's that's what it is. And the more accurate information you can put into it, the better your chances are that that app's going to give you an accurate answer. Yeah. Do you have to put in something like the range you originally zeroed your uh, your rifle in? Yeah, that's one of the first ones. Yeah. So to that, most of the time, a hundred yard zero is fine. Okay. Uh, 
big bore stuff, especially if you're shooting way the hell out there, I like to use a 300-yard zero um, only because you get – with those big bullets, you want to you want to be able to have them separate enough so that they don't just make one ragged hole on your target mm-hmm. and just obliterate where you're – where the center was, you don't really know, am I a tenth off? Am I two tenths off? I have no idea. So a 300-yard group there is not far enough where changes in atmospherics will affect your zero too much, okay. but it's close enough where, um, or it's, it's a far enough where you can get that separation of those rounds. So even if you shoot a half-minute gun, an inch and a half between uh, impacts, that's enough to have paper between it where you can get a good separation. You can really fine-tune that zero. Yeah. But for pretty much anything under a 338, I do a 100 yard zero. Okay. Would you try to shoot when there's minimal wind, say in the morning or late afternoon? Uh, morning is is typically when the wind is at its quietest or slowest, whatever you want to call that. Um, I like to shoot when there's overcast uh, because mirage is kept yep. to a minimum. If you have to shoot in, in mirage, you don't really have a choice. I just sit there, I wait, I look at that target, I see that thing moving with the mirage. I just average where that is and yep. just make my shot. Um, but uh, typically, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, zero it. If it's a hunting rifle especially, I'll try and zero it in the same sort of conditions that I'll be hunting in, which is why you know you see a, what the end of October, early November, all the rifle ranges are Everybody. full of people zeroing Everybody. their stuff, which makes sense. I don't blame them. It's that time of the year. You can't zero it in June and expect it to shoot the same in November. Um, just all the different variations there. But uh, but anyway, yeah, that's what I would say on zero. Okay. Now, before we wrap things up, for someone like me who's just, you know, like you said, I'm only into really just carbines, handguns, mm-hmm. shotguns, what is some basic equipment I would need to get started? Let's see. A good one on that one. I would think a gun. Right? Yeah, aside uh, yeah, from a rifle, <laughs> turns out. Um, if you want to get into long-range shooting, you don't necessarily want to drop the big bucks on a, on a big gun yet. And especially if you, if you want to learn, we did a video on this with, uh, Kiefer, with uh, Kiefer, Jason, and Luke and I on 22s. 22 is a great round to learn on because it's going to produce so much bullet drop over a really short distance that you can learn everything you want to learn about long-range for ammo that is less than 10 cents around and low recoil it's quiet it's the rifles themselves can be very cheap it's great practice great practice uh so but basically um divide your budget so that um you get a good scope um for me picking out the scope is the is the hardest part when I'm building a new rifle system. That's so, my least favorite part about shopping for gun stuff is I trying know. to find the scope. <laughs> I, spent, I spent more on the scope than I did on the gun. There's no financial uh, sort of chart that you have to follow. You don't have to spend as much on the, on the scope as you do the gun because we sell AIs that are 10000 bucks. The scope's going to give you the data you want. Yeah, yeah. So, But basically, I would have a nicer scope and an okay rifle than vice versa. So I would advise putting your money into your optic. Uh, depending on what sort of budget you're looking at, basic entry level price to get something good is about four to five hundred bucks. That'll get you an Athlon or Vortex Venom, and so on. Um, Night Force ATAC R is good, but for a thousand bucks less, get an NX8. What about other things like uh, we have a bipod here, yeah. but also things like uh, shooting bags, mats, uh, that sort of thing. You can skip the shooting mat for now. Um, a decent bipod, a Harris in most cases going to be fine for you. They're a little over a hundred bucks. Rear bag, pick one. Mm-hmm. But definitely get one. Definitely are, get one. Really nice Don't get a have. monopod. Get yes. a bag. Monopods are not as nice to shoot off of as bags. And we have tab gear. We have Armageddon gear. Don't need to do too much research. Everyone gets too crazy with figuring out the right bag and they try a thousand different bags and all that sort of thing. Keep it simple. Get it, Get a bag and mess with it and just practice building your position because building your position is going to it's going to help you shoot more accurately and not waste ammo when you're trying to hit something down range. Yeah. What's great about bags like the rear bag is um once you get comfortable with it, you know, you know where to put it, how to hold it or whatever. Yeah. You got your your hand, you know, reach back on that bag. Mm-hmm. You could really adjust your elevation just yep. by squeezing that bag. 
Yeah. So you don't have to move a whole lot of your body to make your gun move the way you need it to move. So yeah. you can stay in position. A lot of the times when you take a novice, and uh, before I do this, gentlemen, this is an empty rifle, just so you guys can see that, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people, when they're new to shooting scoped rifles, they'll kind of do one of these. You'll be kind of way back here, kind of over here, kind of close. They clearly, they can't get it. They can't get it nice and nice and comfortable on it. Whereas, you know, even if you're um, getting a rifle that doesn't have adjustable mm -hmm. components on it, like like this Bergar, um, you still have the ability to just plant yourself right on it. Like you know yeah. to get right to that certain spot. So, um, and shooting bows, we call that your anchor. Anchor. Yeah. So when you're pulling that string back, you find your anchor. I'm not sure if you use the same terminology or not, but this, essentially that seems what it, what it, what you're doing. Doesn't seem like a bad idea. Cheek rest, I guess. Yeah. So find out where you're most comfortable, where you're actually, your actual your anchor, your position. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, if you're just getting a rifle you, and you can't look at it in, in in the store or something, having one with an adjustable comb, I think, highly advantageous. Um, yeah. I'd I'd have I would value this over length of pull adjustment personally comfort and consistency is kind of yeah. key to long range shooting yeah and being able to get a comfortable cheek weld to me is more important mm -hmm. than a certain length of pull as long as you know you're a normal sized uh, person a, the uh, length of pull between 13 and a half 14 some inches is, is going to be fine yep. um but uh that and then a rear bag and then just just sit there and practice getting on your scope uh but as far as materials go yeah at a decent bipod. You can do it. You can do a Harris if you don't want to go all out. This is a four hundred dollar Thunder Beast with a hundred fifty, hundred and sixty dollar really right stuff attachment for it. You can you can easily go nuts yep. with buying all these accessories and stuff. Wouldn't a sandbag if you've got a hard set object and your gun is sitting on there? Would that not give you enough stability to get data and to learn from, or would you recommend going right to a bipod? Right to a bipod. Okay. The reason being is when you shoot off of a bag on the front versus a bipod off the front, the way the gun recoils is different. Mm -hmm. It'll change your harmonics as well. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if you're off the bag, it'll, it'll, it'll pop off the bag. If you don't sure. have a bipod, I mean, it would be a good place to start with a bag if you had yeah. somewhere where you could maybe yeah. get down prone or As a stopgap, it's fine. Yeah, but um, I would say if you if you have the means to go right into a bipod, um, that's what I would suggest. And I will give a, uh, one piece of advice here too because I did this. I learned the hard way. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get a bipod and you want to do an ex inexpensive one, that's fine. But get a good, reliable, inexpensive one. For example, I have an Atlas now, but mm -hmm. we all know how expensive they are. Yeah, the Harris is great. Now, here's, here's, here's why I say this, because I went online and thinking, okay, it's just a couple of springs and legs, and you can mount it to your gun. How hard is that? Yeah. Bought one on Amazon. You got a Chinese one. It was so bad. My whole yeah. gun was just canted, and you couldn't change anything about it. You got a non-swivel one, right. too, yeah. Yep. So you, if you want a bipod, you can be, quote, cheap, but don't be, like, don't. Too cheap. Yeah. Get I'd something reliable see, that's inexpensive. Make yourself a sandbag before you buy a Chinese bipod. Right. Um, Chinesium. But um, make sure the bipod you get will swivel like this. Yeah. Don't get the one that's fixed. That's because you need to be, you need to be able to level your gun. Um, also, uh, bubble level. Oh, there's one integrator in the back of this one. There is, and I haven't tested the accuracy of it. Typically, I prefer a bubble level that's rail mounted. So you, we sell one by U.S. Optics and Air Attack and maybe a couple others. It just clamps on right to the rail right here, sticks out to the left, one even folds to, to uh, tuck itself out of the way. This is a better representation of level than the stock, possibly. What about a uh, bubble level that attaches to a scope, uh, scope itself or to a scope ring? It has the potential of error that is human-induced. In when you set up the bubble level that clamps to the scope tube, you have to set that up, which means you have to level that scope and you have to... Tighten it and and sit back and measure and check and all that sort of stuff. If you put it on a uh, ring top bubble level that goes that replaces the top of your scope ring, um, two issues there. One is when you when you clamp the rings down, it's we all like to make sure that it's perfect, but it's not always perfect. They shift. They shift a little bit, which is fine. There's a tolerance to that for holding the scope just fine, and you're good. But if you put a bubble on that. That's not going to be level. Secondarily, when you're behind the optic, you have to lift your head to see, to see the bubble. Uh, I see. 
which kind of defeats the purpose of having because you're disrupting your position to check. And as you check, it and might as you check, change it might, position. Exactly. So being able to look through your optic with your right eye, if you're right-handed, and mm-hmm. look at the bubble kind of with your left eye and just kind of go back, changing your focus, Yep, you're good there. That's the way to do it. Um, so, I mean, things like the rifles themselves, um, I'd say a good place to start on something like these probably be something like a CTR, Bugar HMR, something of that nature, right about the thousand dollar mark. Yep. Uh, but make sure it's got a barrel that's that's uh, thick enough to maintain decent accuracy. Uh, you know, a, a stock that's ergonomically shaped for precision shooting. You can learn on your daddy's hunting rifle. Yeah. You're fine, but it's just not going to give you the ergonomics to learn that much from it. Yep. It'll. It, you're losing the creature comforts that you get with something. Yeah. You spend a little bit more money and on. It's tough to get into something that is so different. It's like learning how to drive on a quad bike mm-hmm. and then getting into a car. It's similar in some ways, but it's yeah. totally it's not it's not going to work. Yeah. Yep. So well, I think that about uh, wraps it up unless you guys have anything else. I don't really have a lot. You want to talk about cartridges, didn't you? Uh I mean we could, yeah, uh a cartridge to start out on. Is there anything that 22 yeah. Um, yeah. It depends on your on your distances that you're trying to shoot. To. Budget as well, and 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 budget of course. Now, yeah. if you're shooting a thousand yards, six five Creed's going to dominate that. Three oh eight's fun at a thousand. Three oh eight's not strong at a thousand like mm-hmm. like a six five Creed more is. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, balance ba- uh, balance your budget, barrel life, um, distance. What you need that bolt to do? Just need to hit the target mm-hmm. at a thousand. It's fine. If you need it to to knock something down at a thousand. Yeah. Different discussion. You know, like a, a long range uh, PRS type shooters are, sh- are shooting a lot of ammunition per year. So they need, they also need to find something that's barrel friendly to a degree because they, they will change out their barrels when they need to. But if they can have a barrel that lasts longer, an entire season, even. entire season, even that would be ideal. Yep. So you can't just have an overboard, like a six, five PRC really high performance. I don't know too, too many people shooting it in PRS. It's hot. It's hot. It might be too fast for regulation, yep. and it might be – it just burns barrels. A lot of guys are shooting a much lower capacity casing with a 6 or a 6.5 mil bullet. But logistics are important too. Can you get this ammunition? Mm-hmm. I can go online right now and find 175 grand 308 for a little over a dollar a round. Not yep. bad. Shooting five or 600 yards, that's really good. Match 6.5 Creedmoor, a little bit more expensive – Hand loading, it, that's really complicated. Yeah. But if you're just learning, either get a 22. If you're shooting out to four or 500 yards, get a 223. If you're shooting out to seven or 800, you can start flirting with 308s. Yep. 1,000, 6.5. And, and since this is like a basics video yeah. and somebody getting started, uh, what accuracy do you want to see at 100 yards for somebody getting started? One MOA. Yeah. Don't get nuts. Yeah. Um, as long as you can, basically, when you're learning, you need to be able to evaluate how good you can shoot the rifle. And learn the discipline. Yeah. So it's not just being able to know where to aim. Mm-hmm. It's being able to actually do a tight group, which is yeah. easier said than done. So every once in a while, just go out to the range and do a, do a few three, five round groups mm-hmm. and see where you plateau. Because as you get better, those groups will get smaller. Then they'll, they'll stop getting smaller. And Even you've if reached. you have a center fire rifle and you want to set up on a bench or yeah. somewhere and dry fire. I mean... Mm-hmm. Learn good habits and follow exactly. through. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a major thing. It is. It is. So, and would snap caps be involved in that list of things for beginners? I don't think you need to. Uh, Maybe center, center fire. fire. Center f- for rim fire, definitely. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a second because I'm kind of confused on the issue. I understand dry firing rim fire. That's a big no no. Yes. Now, center fire. Are you have any risk at all of damaging your fire pin or any components if you're just dry firing that thing, trying to get a good no. stance or no your anchor? Because that that firing pin is just going to fall into nothing. Yeah. It's not going to peen itself across the inside of the barrel, like on a rimfire gun. Mm-hmm. So um, you're fine. Do you need snap caps? No. If anything, just use, an, use a, a spent case. Yeah. You know, I'm all for doing this cheap. Yeah. There's no point in dropping a whole bunch of money on it. You can do it for not a ton of money and not a ton of confusion and still be good. That's kind of, that was kind of the, the, the point of all this. And I want to see more people do long-range shooting. I don't, I, it really bugs me when someone doesn't want to get into it because they think it's either too expensive or too complicated. Over, yeah, overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. 
No, yeah, it is simple. It's just once you have to, it's like anything. You have to, once you break through the terminology, Mm -hmm. you gain an understanding Mm -hmm. of, you know, how to get your data, how to record Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Um, Just like anything, how to cook. It's the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, You just have to get through it. Yeah, I mean, there's basic, I mean, you and I both ride motorcycles, um, basic riding, basic terms, and then there's racing, Mm -hmm. like being a track rider, different step up, you know, so um, you don't need to, don't need to be able to shoot quarter minute groups at two th- at two thousand yards all day. Just one MOA. Honestly, most go- most scopes and ammunition are better than that. But if you if you can if you can shoot to one minute, you're fine. Yep. I think we covered a lot. Covered a lot. I feel like it did get complicated, even though that was kind of not what I was going for. But uh, I think it was pretty easy to, under- to understand okay. myself. Okay. Um. Granted, I've I have a little more understanding than maybe. Some. Average Joe off the street who's never yeah. shot a rifle before. Yeah, this 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 whole discussion implies that you have some shooting experience, mm-hmm. like like uh, both of you guys do, mm-hmm. just not long range. Right. So it's building from a little bit of a foundation of, sh- of just basic rifle shooting. All right, cool. Well, uh, if you if anyone listening or watching the video has any questions, you can actually write in to the show. It's uh, group therapy at eurooptic.com. If you have questions about today's episode, uh, about today's episode or previous episodes, we can touch on that in future episodes, retroactively answer them, even though the topic might be different. Um, but we definitely want some engagement, so feel free to write in. You can comment below if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, get a hold of us on Facebook. Give us a call in the office. I mean, we're here to help out. So, But thanks for listening to us today, and uh, I guess we'll see you next time. Thanks.